Hello, South Africa, and welcome back to CoronaCast, your twice weekly information hub where you can access the most up to date information around the COVID crisis in South Africa. My name is John Steenhuizen, leader of the Democratic Alliance and the host for today. We've got another action packed show, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that later. But first of all, today is International Nurses Day. And I think that we ordinarily pay tribute to our nurses on days like this. But today's extra special. Our nurses around the country are on the front line of the battle against the spread of COVID in the country. And I think that an extra special tribute must be played uh, to all of them today. So if you're in the nursing sector, thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for what you're doing to help our country and to keep our people safe. Today is day 47 of the uh, lockdown. Uh, we're into day 12 of level four uh, of the lockdown. To all of the viewers who wrote in and shared messages of support after the speech that we made last week on Friday, uh, calling on President Ramaphosa to really consider opening up the economy before it causes long lasting harm uh, to many people in South Africa. Thank you and uh, really appreciate those messages of support that are coming through from all of you. And we're going to keep the pressure up to start ensuring we have a far more rational uh, lockdown model that opens up in a safe way more aspects of the economy so that we can avert an economic depression that's going to cause hardship for many, many more South Africans. I also want to let you know that I've uh, made a call today for President Ramaphosa to come out and address South Africans. It's been 19 days since we last heard from the president. Uh, and I think that in a time of crisis like this, we should be receiving regular briefings uh, from our leaders and explaining why in this lockdown, uh, many of these draconian decisions that are being made and leveling with us about the modeling and the data. Uh, we saw some really disturbing reports in the weekend papers that government is deliberately keeping the real figures away from South Africans because they don't want to alarm South Africans or cause panic or create stigma. But this is a democracy and in a democracy, citizens have a right to know why their government is making certain decisions. The more you level with citizens, the more you are able to make them real effective partners in the battle against the virus. Keeping our citizens in the dark, treating them like children, instead of actually leveling with them about why we're doing what we need to do, uh, is really does, it is not a good sign for a democracy. And so we're challenging government to release the figures, share with us the data, take us into your confidence around why you are making certain of these decisions, which frankly don't make sense. Many, many South Africans are getting frustrated, uh, angry, and very, very concerned about their future, both uh, viability as a business, but also how they're going to feed their families and provide for themselves and their future going forward. These are all important questions. Now's the time that our leaders should be providing reassurance to the nation, not hiding away from them. And so we really hope that the president will heed the call to come out and address the nation and that he would start to have more regular briefings with us instead of leaving us at the mercy of ministers who, many of whom don't understand how an economy works or the ill effects that some of their ill thought out uh, and ill conceived regulations are having on the people of South Africa and on uh, our economy. We've also seen escalation in violence meted out by the security services. Just this week, we've seen a number of incidents where police clearly in violation of the constitution and the rule of law have been marching onto people's properties, uh, making arrests on private property, going into people's homes and clearly abusing the power that's been entrusted to them. We're a democracy. Democracy is underpinned by the rule of law, the principles of openness and transparency, and a nation that expects a government to protect them, not to work against them. Now is not the time, particularly in time of crisis, for this type of draconian jackboot behavior by members of the security services. There are many, many South African policemen and women, members of the military and security services who do a sterling job every day, and they are let down by the bad behavior of these bad elements that are being allowed to run unbridled across the length and breadth of South Africa. We need to remember our constitution is not suspended. This is a state of disaster. It's not a state of emergency. That means that the Bill of Rights is still in place and citizens have rights, they have responsibilities, 
and they also have the dignity to be treated like adults in a situation where uh, they have an elected government. And so we are going to continue to put pressure on some of the more draconian regulations. We are already in court on one of them. We will be announcing later this week court action on two other key ones. Uh, but that's not what today's show is about. We'll dedicate a show to that later. And today we want to talk a little about the economy and particularly e-commerce. Uh, for those of you who haven't seen the great video that our trade and industry minister, uh, shadow minister Dean McPherson did, uh, where he used e-commerce to send a textbook on e-commerce to the Minister of Trade and Industry, showing him how safe and easy it is to ensure that people are able uh, to access that information. I really encourage you to have a look at it. It's on the DA website, on our channels, uh, but just shows you how absurd it is that in this time uh, we have a lockdown on e-commerce when it is actually the safest way to allow consumers to access products uh, from the comfort of their own home where they don't have to interact with other citizens, they don't have to exchange uh, money or credit cards and touch keypads, uh, they're able to safely browse uh, products online, order them into their homes uh, in a safe manner where they can be delivered using PPE from a factory where social distancing and PPE is being practiced. It makes sense to allow e-commerce to operate in this time. We're one of the only countries in the world where e-commerce is not being allowed in this time. Many other countries that have been in lockdown have allowed those companies that are able to move their presence online to operate freely. Even the World Trade Organization has come out at this time and endorsed e-commerce as a way to keep economies moving while we face uh, this pandemic. So we're going to be talking about that a bit later today and I have the CEO of Bid or Buy, Craig Lubber, the CEO of Yuppie Chef, Andrew Smith, the business manager of U-Africa, Anita Erasmus, and the managing director of Payfast, Jonathan Smith, with me in studio today. And uh, another surprise for you, we'll be joined in studio by the DA's chief whip in parliament. Um, she's feisty and she gets the job done, Natasha Mazzoni, and she's going to be talking to us uh, a little bit about some of the challenges we've been having in Parliament uh, around uh, making sure there is oversight and accountability of the government at this time. But before we get into the show, I want to share the daily statistics with you. Uh, South Africa currently has 1,350 confirmed cases of coronavirus. As of today, we also have 206 confirmed deaths and our condolences to uh, the friends, family and loved ones of those who have lost their life uh, to the virus. Uh, we particularly at this time express condolences to the family of the former registrar of the medical schemes in South Africa who has also tragically lost his life as a result of this virus. But the good news, we've had 4,357 recoveries in South Africa, which shows that early detection, testing, tracing and tracking, uh, and we get that right, we can defeat the virus. And that many, many more people will recover from the virus than will succumb to it. I'm then over to, going to go hand over now to um, Natasha Mazzoni and we're going to talk a little bit around all things Parliament. Tash, we had a bit of a shocker last week. Uh, the programming committee, you were in the meeting, uh, got hacked by some outside people who uh, showed uh, some very uh, unsavory images, not for, for family viewing. Uh, do you want to talk about, a bit about the incident and what Parliament's going to do to resolve that and how this affects oversight and accountability? Well, thanks, John. Yeah, it, it wasn't um, exactly what I thought would happen. A programming committee meeting is normally quite a mellow meeting of Parliament, so mm. there's never much excitement. But uh, it just so happened as I started to speak, uh, the next thing, our screen was taken over by... Um, uh, who I assume a really naughty kid who mm. had access to Pornhub and they they flashed up Pornhub on the screen and while we were mm. trying to have a meeting they they shared the screen but I must make this point very clear Parliament is calling it a hack mm. it actually wasn't a hack mm. this is what Parliament did Parliament put the Zoom meeting number as well as the Zoom meeting password on Twitter that means anyone in the country could have had access to that mm. particular meeting. Now, while in Parliament we are the People's Parliament, and of course we want everyone to participate, we mm. don't want people participating in the meeting where they can take part and certainly share their Pornhub screen, screen with us. Mm. So I think the essential lesson that we've learned is that the public in our journey and this e-journey we take with Parliament is going to have to watch Parliament uh, via the YouTube channel or on the 408 channel, mm. but we are not going to make public the passwords mm. to our specific portfolio meetings because 
because there are a lot of people at home who are looking for mischief mm. and this was exactly the kind of thing they wanted to do and they wanted mm. to dis mm. disrupt a meeting and it, it was a bit of a shocker I must mm. be honest. Well let's talk about oversight and accountability in the COVID environment. Uh, we've seen a number of parliaments around the world starting to have virtual sessions of the actual plenary. We've seen the Prime Minister's questions in, uh, in uh, the UK. Mm. We've seen uh, virtual parliamentary sittings in Brazil and many other countries. Uh, how far are we away from having a full parliamentary session, a question session, where we can exercise uh, the oversight and accountability that's required of us in terms of the Constitution? Well, we're pushing very hard to have as many portfolio committee meetings as we can. Um, I'm, I'm concerned at the way Parliament is conducting these meetings because I don't think that it's a conducive environment when you give someone three minute speaking slots to mm. really hold an entity to account. Mm. So I think we have to really look at the way we, we hold these particular meetings. But in terms of the questions and answers, we're looking as uh, close as the end of the month to have our first questions and answer session happening. Um, we're even looking at doing a hybrid model because now we know that with social distancing and the wearing of masks and the necessary sanitation, we mm. could have certain members of parliament in the house as mm. well as having the other members of parliament who are perhaps high risk and cannot travel uh, zooming in with us uh, via the e-platform. Mm. So there are many ways in which we can do it but the one thing that the DA is making sure of is that we may remain constitutionally in line and do not become constitutionally delinquent and mm. Uh, we are coming up with fantastic solutions that we're sharing with Parliament. We think mm. it's fair. We've given our assurances to Parliament that we'll offer any solutions that we have. As you know, John, we have meetings where our entire caucus meets, our entire mm. shadow cabinet meets. It works very well. You just have to understand the technology and you have to be able to chair a meeting. Mm. So I think as soon as our chair people in Parliament um, understand the technology and actually accept mm. the role they have as chair people, mm. we will have a, a lot more control uh, as mm. to how we exercise our oversight. I think it's also important that this starts to roll out to local councils. You know, I've interacted with um, all of our DA uh, local government caucuses in the metros uh, over the course of the last week. I did it from the comfort of my own home and not a single hotel had to be booked, not a single air uh, ticket had to be bought or a single car had to be hired, but able to meet with hundreds of people uh, at different parts of the country. Um, their big concern is that, you know, the, many of their councils are not meeting mm. and there's no oversight and accountability there. So uh, I, mean, I think obviously we need to get Parliament to roll this out as mm. well. We'll certainly start setting the example so that other uh, legislative and elected bodies can start to, start to participate. John, you're absolutely correct and I think that we now have to assume that if councils are refusing to meet, they are trying to hide something mm. because councils now have every opportunity to meet on the digital platform as well as in the hybrid platform. Mm. And there is no way for councils to hide. And it's quite a challenge uh, that we put out there. But we are now saying if you refuse to meet, you are being constitutionally delinquent. And mm. certainly from the DA side, we are not going to allow for it to happen. Mm. And if councils are refusing to meet, the DA councillors are certainly going to have their meetings uh, as mm. they would normally have um, and going to make sure that they do mm. their jobs as councillors because they've also sw sworn an oath of office yeah. just as we have. Mm. And we have a duty to uphold and we have the duty to hold the executive or the councils to, mm. to account. And that's certainly from the DA side, an instruction that's come from you as our leader and an instruction that's gone out through the party, through mm. our federal structures, mm. that the DA must always hold um, their structures to mm. account. Uh, I mean, I see po political parties the world over are having to change their, the whole way they operate. I mean, politics has always been about bringing large numbers of people together into groups, having public meetings, town hall meetings. Uh, that's going to be certainly for the next 18 to 24 months uh, impossible to do. And I see today that the Democratic Party in the United States are planning on having their uh, elective conference, uh, their Democratic National Congr uh, Conference uh, on a virtual platform. And Joe Biden is championing that, uh, which is going to make it very interesting. I mean, we're also faced with some dilemmas here. We're also due to have a Congress later this year, uh, an elective Congress, very important one, a policy Congress. Uh, do you see it working on, on digital platforms? Absolutely, John. I think that we've seen our first, the DA's rolled out the first ever South African town hall meeting mm. on a virtual platform uh, that Helen Zilla did in the city of Twane to explain mm. the judgment there. Mm. And we had unprecedented numbers of mm. people joining our town hall meeting because people didn't have to leave the comfort of their homes. They could join on, mm. on, the, on the internet. They felt safe because, of course, mm. safety in our country is a problem, especially if you have meetings at night. And, of course, costs to get mm. to a specific meeting. 
I'm one of the people who is completely in favour of having uh, our policy conference as well as our elective conference on, mm. on, on a digital platform. I see no mm. reason why we couldn't have it done. I think we'll save our party an immense amount of money because mm. we won't have to worry about people travelling or catering for mm. accommodation. Uh, people, we, we're going to have a, 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 certainly if we do it, we'll look at ways of having a, um, the vote done in a fair and safe manner, in a completely transparent manner. And I think that as, as the world develops and changes, the one thing COVID has taught us is that it will never be business again as usual. And I don't mm. think that that's a bad thing. I think that we are going to be saving companies, parties, governments, mm. an enormous amount of money. And uh, certainly, I, th I think you'd agree with me, sometimes it is just a lot easier to do something from home on the virtual platform than having to get on a plane and fly somewhere. Mm. Um, I think it's the convenience of it mm. is, is also showing to be a, a huge advantage. Mm. I had to get in my car though to go to a meeting and I was sort of Got in and wondered, why am I doing this? But you know, I've, got, I've got so used to being <laughs> yes. able to do it with my pajama pants still on, you know, from the comfort of your own home. And, Quite uh, right. Yeah, it's certainly, uh, I think we, you know, coronavirus has certainly changed the way we work. And, you know, I think that's what we want to talk about today. And so we're going to cross over now to our uh, panel and very, very uh, grateful to be joined by the CEO of Bidabar, Craig uh, Lubber, the CEO of Yappy Chef, Andrew Smith the business manager of U-Africa, Anita Erasmus, and the managing director of Payfast, Jonathan Smith. And they're joining us because of the social distancing requirements uh, uh, via a video link into the CoronaCast studio today. So welcome to all of you and welcome to CoronaCast and thank you for making yourselves available. Uh, and we really appreciate the time that you've, you've given to us today to take uh, South Africa through e-commerce and the e-commerce dilemma and why it is so important. So I'm going to start off by asking you, what has the impact on the coronavirus been on your e-commerce uh, platform and site? We'll start with you. Um, uh, who's it? Craig, you, you're, on, you're on first, Craig. Absolutely. So we, you know, we've had a big impact. Um, we have seen certain increases in, in things like digital sales, like your PlayStation and Xbox vouchers, etc., together with airtime and things that can be essentially bought and, and sold digitally. Um, but to give give you a, a picture of, of the impact is that we have lost uh, nearly half of the content that we would typically have on our uh, on our platform, and this is largely due to uh, the merchants that typically trade on our platform um, having to shut doors uh, at least temporarily during the lockdown period. So uh, yes, I think to, to say the least, it has been a, a really big impact on our business. Yeah. And um, we've got uh, Andrew, Andrew, you're with Yappy Chef. Um, obviously, a lot of the kitchens have one of my favorite sites. Um, I love uh, trawling through there and, uh, and grabbing uh, some great stuff online there. Um, Andrew, uh, how many individual individuals does Yappy Chef employ? And has the lockdown affected their jobs? Yeah, John, we, we employ 150 people, and that is made up of the e-commerce part of the business and our stores. We have seven stores. So obviously, from when lockdown happened, our sales went to zero, and, uh, and everyone had to go home, and we had to figure it out. And it, it was really, it felt like we were right at the edge of a 14-year-old business um, ending at, at this time. We have, uh, throughout April, as we kind of figured out what we could and couldn't sell, and as we asked our customers to buy with the promise that we would deliver it later, you know, we, we initially said we'd deliver after lockdown. Well, of course, now we don't even know what that necessarily means. But we have opened up more of the range and what we understand to be permitted. Uh, and we've managed to, to keep all the, the jobs going. We did have to pay less salaries in April. Everyone had to take a cut. Um, and at the moment, we're doing okay. E-commerce is is working for us. All of the stores remain closed, um, but it's such an uncertain time and, and nobody really knows what's happening tomorrow or next week or where we're going. Uh, so we're, we're certainly one of those kind of medium businesses that's that's right on the edge at the moment. Yeah. Uh, Jonathan, your uh, company, Payfast, uh, you know, does a lot of the facilitation for e-commerce. And um, you, do you think why, do you think that e-commerce should be being widened at this stage? And and why do you think that it's it's perfectly adaptable for the COVID environment? So John, yeah, there's no question that uh, you know e-commerce is perfectly positioned to service uh, consumer needs in this time, right? Obviously, everything that you said about the social distancing, uh, not being in crowds, um, able to get it from the comfort of your own home. So absolutely. 
uh, you know, no doubt that it's perfectly positioned. Um, you know, we our base historically was a lot of uh, a lot of retail, right? Online retail, so e-com. Um, as we've matured, that has has actually expanded. So it's really digital payment now. So. Uh, you know, we weren't as affected by, you know, the drop in, in retail. We had other things that increased at the time, um, certain sectors who were essential, others uh, where which were entirely digital. So uh, airtime, you know, to what Craig was saying. So it's actually been quite, quite interesting for us to see. And we started to put out some statistics about that. You know, my view generally on this, though, is that while, you know, obviously I'm, I'm very pro for, uh, for e-com, I'm generally just pro the country getting back to business. Mm -hmm. I think that we really need to take cognizance of this thing. We're all kind of in it together. Let's practice good hygiene control, all the rest of it. But I don't think that we as a country can afford to not be working. It is just, um, it's an untenable situation. And to force these measures that are going to have a very impactful long-term, or will be very impactful long-term, is um, not a great position to be in when we're already not doing well uh, from an economic perspective as a country. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Anita, you with you Africa, and you Africa is responsible, I'm sure, getting many of these products to customers. Um, has your business been affected at this time? And and do you believe that uh, using PPE, uh, the type of delivery could could be taking place in a safe way? You know, a lot of people are saying, you know, the the you know the, the those who say that uh, e-commerce should not be allowed are saying, oh well, it's going to spread the virus. Uh, have you guys applied your mind to how this could work without? Uh, spreading the virus and in a safe way? Um, yes, John, I think just answering your first question, it definitely affected our business. Um, as you've mentioned, we basically facilitate the shipping part, so um, all e-commerce merchants need to, to ship their parcels to their customers. So it's not just the online platform, but I think they work very closely along with career companies to kind of you know facilitate the whole process of getting the parcels delivered. Um, as e-commerce sales um, slowed down or dropped a lot, of course, from our side, we also see uh, saw a very high decrease in um, the amount of parcels being shipped. So for the month of April, we did about, I would say, 30% of the volumes that we would usually do. Um, we have luckily seen that now on level four increased a bit, where um, e-commerce merchants that weren't allowed to ship their goods during um, the first lockdown um, is now able to ship them. So at least we have seen some improvement, um, but how long that will be, um, we won't know. Um, so yes, it has definitely affected our business. We work with about 1,000 SME e-commerce stores, and I've seen a lot of the comments that was even made is that they would say, you know, SME is just e-commerce is just big business, um, it's not small businesses, but because we work with so many of those typical you know, SME e-commerce stores, I can really say that it's affected them as well. If you think of our volumes has dropped um, with 70%, it's a direct, it speaks directly to the fact that their sales has also dropped. Um, so we communicate with a lot of our merchants, um, we feel for them, and, and I think we can definitely see that it's affecting their business as well. And these are smaller guys working from their homes, um, trying to make a living. So I really believe that if we can expand the category, um, we will be able to assist not just the bigger companies, but the smaller companies as well. Um, and then just to give you an answer on your on the second mm. question. Mm. So a lot of the career companies decided to keep on operating um, during the lockdown, um, still being able, of course, to deliver essential goods. Um, we work very closely with a lot of career companies, so we get a very good idea of what they've implemented. They've done a lot and they've spent thousands, if not millions of rands on protective gear, training their drivers and really trying to follow in a very short period, implementing a lot of processes, um, touchless deliveries, you know, having their drivers with the, all the required equipment. Um, so they've done a lot and we've really seen them come on board. So I honestly believe that um, e-commerce, and that's why I'm here today as well, is um, that it's really a method of, of retail that allow for a lot of or, or less social distance than with normal retail. Um, so I really believe that with the career companies and e-commerce platforms that we can make this work. Sure. Thanks, Anita. Um, I'm going to go back to you, Craig, at Bid or Buy, because I know that you also provide a platform for 
many of uh, uh, you know of your sellers. Have any of the sellers reached out to you at this time? You know, people that you usually sell products for and expressed concern and and have you been able to assist them in any way? Absolutely. So because our platform charges fees um, when successful sales happen, I think it's had a really, you know, we have a relatively low risk um, for, our, for our merchants that trade on the platform, but, but there definitely has been a, a big concern, um, mainly around trying to find out accurate information um, that uh, to give guidance as to what they can and cannot sell. Um, you know, there's been many, there's so many questions around uh, can you sell winter clothes? But what is what is a shoe? Is it is a sneaker winter summer clothes, etc. Um, so for us, the, the challenge has been to try and provide information that is responsible and accurate, um, and also facilitating communication between uh, the buyers that trade that purchase on our site and also the merchants that um, are trying to get product from A to B. Um, so trying to help facilitate that um, that piece of the, the e-commerce journey with them. And have any of them shared sort of their, their struggle with you in terms of this? Are they, I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of your, of your previous suppliers that are feeling a bit of pain at the moment. Absolutely. So, I mean, I, uh, earlier on I mentioned that we've, we've had around 40% of the, the product that typically would be available on our site uh, is not there anymore. And, and these are essentially merchants that have just said, we have no way to get into work. We have no way to access the product. Um, that we need to ship, and we are also not allowed to ship uh, half of the content that we have. And um, so uh, these these merchants are really concerned. Um, they have product that they've paid for, and they have staff to pay. Um, you know, they rely on uh, career services that also need to pick up uh, content which they cannot now book. Um, so yes, there, there's a there's a really big concern um, from from many of these uh, these merchants. And some have uh, made arrangements, etc., to uh, purchase with the promise of delivery after lockdown, similar to what uh, Andrew said uh, with what Yabi Chef uh, has been doing. Um, but again, when when is lockdown? finished when will that be permitted to ship these goods that is the question yeah i think that's a big question in everyone's mind you know i think we all knew in the hard phase five lockdown when it was going to end we knew it was three weeks we then knew it was going to be an extra two weeks but there was a five weeks and we could all plant it i think the frustrating thing for everybody now is that we don't know when level four uh, you know we're through it and we go to level three we don't even know, you know what would mean us going back to level five if, if necessary because we don't know what those parameters are. But I just wanted to ask you a question because you know, this is one of the things that the critics keep saying, well, you know, it'll be unsafe for people to go back to work. Have you put in place in your depot, your warehouse, uh, the you know, social distancing, PPE, et cetera, and, and how is that working? So for for Bid or Buy, we don't have a warehouse. So we facilitate transactions between other merchants who have warehousing. Um, but I, I, I can speak um, probably on behalf of, of merchants that are transacting is that you have a situation where uh, these merchants are fully in control over their procedures in place. They can measure their staff's temperatures, they can wear protective equipment, um, they can ship goods, they can uh, you know, put the goods in a, in a courier vehicle. Um, that's no different to the process that is involved in getting content uh, or product and content from uh, a distributor to a physical retail spot. I think the only difference there is that um, these retailers now require customers to physically walk into uh, a space uh, amongst other people touch products, maybe put it back, uh, interact with cashiers, etc. So there are so many more variables and, and for me it's just unfathomable um, that, that you wouldn't allow e-commerce uh, to, to, to work um, and, and to operate. So back to the question for, for Bid or Buy, we have a, a very small staff contingent uh, in office um, and we are facilitating phone calls. Um, we, you know, we're having a few hundred calls every day between customers, uh, buyers and sellers. So we are doing that, but, but the, remaining, uh, the remainder of the staff are, are still at home and working mm -hmm. remotely. And then just let's look at the value chain here because you, know, you said Bid or Buy, you the, the sort of the middleman, you use a courier service to get the product from you to, or, or from, you, from your supplier to your client. Um, have, have, you, have you heard any, uh, many of them, are they facing a difficult time, the courier company? Do you use one courier company or do you use a variety of them? And if so, um, are, are they struggling as well as a result of, 
uh, of this e-commerce ban? Absolutely. So, so we support businesses from single sole proprietors all the way uh, to small businesses and, and one or two larger retailers. Um, so if you think about you know, this, uh, this knock-on effect, it's not just the e-commerce jobs uh, that, that are at risk. Um, there are warehousing staff um, that, that may be at risk of losing jobs, uh, call centers that, that support these transactions. Um, I even know there are producers of packaging who now have to lay off staff because they don't need to manufacture as many boxes. Um, and then there are logistics networks, and, and we make use, uh, not personally, but through our merchants of um, the services at U Africa, so through all the courier services that they aggregate, but then many other courier services as well that, that our merchants uh, use. So this has a massive knock-on effect ultimately um, down the line. Sure. Anita, um, to, to carry on from what John was, was asking Craig, in terms of logistics, obviously logistics is a, an incredibly important part of, of e-commerce and this ban has had a huge impact on, on the way you operate your logistics. In terms of your staffing component, has this e-ban caused you to have a, a reduction in staff and how are your staff handling uh, the situation of, of the e-commerce ban? I mean, has it had a, a massive effect on, on your ability to adjust your logistics? Um, no, Natasha, I can speak, I mean, we are a platform, so we more from a technology perspective, but we work directly with a lot of these career companies, so I believe I can, I can speak on behalf of them. What we see, the biggest issue for us, and if I say us, I can come referring to them as well, is the fact of liability. So how a career company would have worked in the past is, remember, the career will, a parcel is being booked, the career will come and they will collect the parcel. They've got no idea what is the actual content of that parcel. Uh, the parcel is already in package, the courier will come, they collect the parcel, and then deliver it to your customer. Now, with the regulations of the lockdown, where the couriers need to differentiate between what is the content of the parcel, it really affected how they operate. Um, and it had to kind of, I think they had to think a little bit differently about how they do things. And at the end of the day, they did implement a lot of things. For example, you now need your CRPC document on each parcel, a declaration form stating what is the content of the parcel. So there's a lot of, I would say, cost of complexity added from the career company side for them to implement these measures. But sadly, they're also limited because they can't take the box and actually open up to see what is inside. So from a liability issue, even for us as an you know, intermediate platform and the, the couriers, we found, or we, we um, I think they were stressed a bit. Um, we could see they wasn't sure how to handle this. Um, and I think they're still struggling because they're taking liability for shipping a parcel and they're only allowed to ship a certain type of product, but they can't really kind of differentiate between what they are shipping and what not. So they've really tried to implement measures um, to limit this and to manage this. But I think it's a very big frustration, not just for them, but also for the merchant shipping. Because there's a lot of documentation they need to complete, um, you know, extra paper that needs to be printed. And I, so I think that is really, that's where we saw, I think, the biggest issue was with the career companies in terms of, you know, who's taking liability for what can be shipped and what not. Anita, obviously you work with a multitude of, of courier companies that, that courier different things around the country, different areas of the country. Now, because of this sort of broad ban that we've had and, and the, the way no one's really understood at, at certain points what could, what could go, what couldn't go, how we would do this, this touchless courier servicing, have you had any of the people that you work with actually have to shut shop? In other words, close down their businesses because they just simply couldn't stay open long enough to to wait for regulations or the understanding of regulations. So I think what I'm asking you is, do you know people who have had to go out of business because of this e-ban? Um, yes, Natasha, I do know of, of some of our merchants who just basically say, please cancel our, our subscription. We won't be making use of their services anymore. As I've mentioned, we work with typical SME e-commerce stores, and those are people that their cash flow is tight. They work on a month-to-month -month basis. They don't have the financial backing of somebody saying, we can carry you for a month. Um, so for them, I think the first three weeks, what we got from our merchants was, okay, we can do this. Maybe we can survive for three weeks. And we, people were really following the rules and they were kind of saying, okay, you know, if we can, we will try. 
But we've now seen where merchants are just really saying, um, you know, that they come to a point where they don't, it's literally between, will I be able to operate or should I just close down? Mm-hmm. And I think that frustration we do feel at the moment, and we've also seen, I'm not going to mention, you know, company names, but mm-hmm. we've had merchants who said, sorry, um, you know, we won't be operating after the lockdown, or actually already closed their business. Mm-hmm. Um, and those are smaller people that employ one or two other employees, but, you know, they've got families behind mm-hmm. them as well. So, of course. Yeah. Jonathan, uh, pay fast, um, you know, processes a lot of these online payments here that, um, and I mean, have you seen, is there, have you got a percentage of the decline in, in transactions that you've seen uh, during this time uh, at pay fast? So what we've actually seen is a, is a bit of a shift, John. So it's, um, you know, there's definitely obviously uh, to, to everyone else's uh, comments on this, uh, you know, obviously supply chain is heavily affected. So any kind of retail, um, you know, that. You can't say that a certain part of it um, works and therefore the whole thing works. You know, if you can't get, you know, one of the big problems is that the ports have been backed up as well, right? So product has not been coming in because of the layers of the ports. Um, you know, people have not been able to get into their, their warehouses or whatnot to be able to ship goods. Um, they're not going to, they're not necessarily in essential services, right? So all of those things impact it. So there definitely has been a marked decrease in um, retail activity occurring online in a typical e-commerce, right? I couldn't give you a percentage off the bat, unfortunately. We've actually been focusing on some of the stuff that's actually increased. So that I kind of know off, off the top of my head, because obviously we've seen a um, commensurate increase in the essential services stuff. So baby products, pet products, uh, telecoms, um, you know, all the things you would expect, right? Yeah. Uh, those have all increased quite dramatically. Um, but obviously the downside of that is there's a whole bunch of industries that have gone to zero. So be it be it travel, be it um, uh, you know, e-commerce that's non-essential goods. Mm-hmm. Uh, something that has been very encouraging to see though, is that a lot of these guys who were positioned um, where they had the platform, they had the distribution, they had the career relationships, they could actually pivot very quickly into uh, selling essential goods, right? Now it's not going to give them uh, the same turnover that they would have had otherwise, but at least it's giving them something to just kind of survive through this period, right? So we've got guys who would have traditionally sold LED light bulbs or, uh, you know, fittings in that nature now selling uh, thermometers, you know, the contactless thermometers uh, or masks, right? So it's been pretty heartening to see um, that innovation happen, uh, th- that ability to pivot into into another industry. Yeah. Um, so it's been really good to, to, to see that. But I mean, I think it's also, I mean, the frustrating thing for me is that you know, e-commerce is such a booming growth industry in so many other countries around the world and has really come into its own during this coronavirus uh, environment. And I think this was a real opportunity for many, many retailers, even small, uh, medium and micro enterprises, to be able to move their products online so that people could access them safely. Uh, I mean, sort of, it, it just doesn't make sense to me that, that you know, we're not using this as an opportunity to, to expand. Rather, it, it seems to me we, we're trying to you know, contain it and close it down rather than, than move, uh, you know, move the country towards e-commerce, which is certainly the trend around the rest of the world. So to your comments, John, I think that, you know, people are doing that, um, you know, and while, I, while obviously the legislation is, is not as permissive as we would all like it to be, um, you know, we've seen a massive surge in registrations, right? So there are many businesses which are now saying, you know, we were putting this off before, now we have to do something about it. So now it just makes, it's, it's actually business sense, right? It's, 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 it's a part of your business continuity planning that, you know, you, you need to understand if you are a retailer, that you're not just an online retailer or an offline retailer, you're a retailer. And online is a channel and offline is a channel. So it has definitely forced a lot of people to accelerate that uh, digital transformation strategy. And something that actually was quite surprising to me is that, yes, we are at the very early stages of e-commerce in South Africa still arguably between 1% and 2% of retail occurs online in South Africa. If you take a developed market, it's between 10 and 20%. But um, So we've got a long way to go. But something that was very surprising for me mm. is that this has actually even been shown to be a trend the world over. I mean, even if you look in developed markets, the US, the UK, Europe, they are seeing a massive shift into digital, which I thought was kind of already there. If you mm. look at some of the largest companies in the world, um, be it uh, PayPal, Stripe, Adyen, you know, payment processes, they've actually said that this is advanced digital transformation three to five years globally. And they're even seeing that in developed markets. So we're seeing the same thing here. Um, but we're not being, from a legislation perspective, quite as, as permissive on a lot of different fronts. Let's just not only go to e-commerce, there's a lot of things we're not being permissive mm-hmm. enough about uh, in, this, in this crisis. But it's a trend that we're definitely seeing here, and it's a trend that's being seen globally as well. Yeah. 
Andrew, uh, when we started out chatting to you, you said that primarily you're an online uh, provider, but you also have, I think you said, seven uh, shops that you, you have across the country. Now, with this with this lockdown and, and certainly the, the, the strange ban on certain issues on, on the e-commerce platform, are you going to have to scale down or how do you see your business moving forward uh, once, once lockdown is lifted? I hope not. We we open. We've been running online for nearly 14 years, and we've been running stores for three years. So we, we're sort of in the other direction from other retailers, uh, but we still believe in physical retail. And, and I think, like Jonathan said, you know, e-commerce for us is not a separate thing. You don't get retail and then e-commerce. Uh, you get retail, and that's made up of of people buying through physical stores and people buying online and having it delivered. So, so I don't think that this is a a case of favouring one part of retail over another. Uh, I think this is what we would like to see is just retail being seen um, as, as one holistic thing. But let's say that the, through the channel of e-commerce, we potentially should be able to sell anything we want, whereas potentially through the channel of, of physical stores, um, there might be some more limitations. So you know, our long-term plans are not necessarily to close our stores, but uh, we'll have to see where the, where the future goes and, and what people... Uh, what the buying habits of people are like in three months' time or six months' time or, or a year's time because um, there's no doubt that, that we're going to be changed and, and, and we are, we're forming habits today that are going to last for a long time. You know, someone like my mom has uh, bought groceries online for the first time during this lockdown. She's certainly never done that before. And will she immediately go back to, to um, going to physical stores afterwards? Maybe not. Maybe this will see that increase, as Jonathan said, between 1% and 2% retail happening online maybe during this period we're going to kickstart something and that number will grow um, significantly afterwards but you know we would like to see e-commerce being enabled for any small retailer you know, we speak to some people who have say three stores and they've never had anything online their stores are not closed they're not allowed to sell it in the current regulations uh, but they're also not allowed to sell online and if they could just themselves go into their store pick the products off the shelf and have it um, delivered to their customers with no contact you know, and I, I can't see I can't see any reason why that shouldn't be allowed. You know, we're not we're not of the opinion that only a few big e-commerce players should be enabled under level five or under level four. You know, for us, it's a lot more about saying what what parts of the economy can we open safely, and we get ourselves tied in these big knots when we try and define essential. Because really, what is essential? Is ice cream essential? You know, are, are Chelsea buns essential? You can't, it's really difficult when you go down the path of saying, we, so we've, we've actually stopped using that word essential. We, we, we're using the word committed because um, essential is a very difficult word to say. And so I would like to see an economy opened up by saying everything that is safe to open should open and let's not worry about uh, what exactly we're defining as essential. I think that's an important point you make there um, because, you know, the thing that frustrates me is about the language is they talk about businesses that are important to the economy and businesses that aren't important to the economy. In my book, every business is important mm. to the economy. Every business is a lifeline for employees, for families, and it's a means to, to providing income. So I'm really uncomfortable with this, you know, this, as you say, this choosing this over that and saying which business is essential and which is not. I mean, every business is essential. Uh, they're the lifeblood of the economy. Yeah, you know, there's even been an interesting debate around the, 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 the this word of fairness, and it wouldn't be fair to open e-commerce, which I find quite disturbing because, based on that logic, should we ban Netflix because it's not fair on DVD stores at this time? Uh, we can't, we can't go down. There's nothing about this virus that is fair. Uh, it's certainly not fair on the tourism industry. It certainly, it hasn't been fair on the restaurant industry. So to try and now pick what is fair to open or not open is a is, is a really tricky business to be in. Um, but, but yes, I think, I think every, every business is vital. You know, we have 150 employees. We also have 450 suppliers, local suppliers that we deal with and partners like courier partners and payment providers. And all of these are being affected because uh, you know, this idea of, well, maybe somebody doesn't really need this product right now. Um, that, that's a really difficult place. I think also just the hoops that everyone has to jump through to try and decide, you know, the, the actual legislation is only about 13 lines long. And, and so everyone is trying, spending so much time and effort locking down certain categories and not categories and, and, and trying to decide. And we're actually not even certain whether everything we can sell is allowed because it doesn't go down to the level of detail that is needed. And if we got away with all of that and just said, is this safe? Is it safe to sell this product? Um, and we can define what we mean by safe a lot easier than trying to define down to individual product levels as to what you can or can't sell. Yeah. You know, John, what you said now about the, the terminology, I think is so important. You know, Andrew, I come from a family of chefs. So a store like Yuppie Chef, 
is for us it's an essential service mm -hmm. but someone else might think it's a niche market have you seen a, a decline or perhaps an increase in your particular niche market because i know myself i've never done as much baking as in cooking as i have done in the last uh, 47 days um and uh, mm -hmm. you know I, I look around my, my my building and everyone's cooking and baking so given that that yuppie chef is a particular niche market have you seen a, an increase are people more more look you know need more cooking essentials and 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 acquiring that or have you seen a, a bit of a decrease and how do you think other niche markets are going to be affected by this kind of lockdown? Well, I, I mean, I, I wouldn't completely agree that we're a niche. Uh, if, if I went into your home and I took out everything from your kitchen and then you came back and, uh, and tried to live in lockdown with nothing that's in your kitchen, I think you'd find that it's definitely not a niche. Yeah. You know, right in the beginning of the lockdown, people were, were pleading with us. They were saying, you know, my microwave is broken or my kettle is mm -hmm. broken or my mm -hmm. toast is broken. I, I, I have to eat at home. I have to buy raw food. And I can't heat it up or I can't cook it. And we had to tell them, I'm sorry, the government has decided that, that this is not essential. Mm -hmm. um, but well, we, we think that they did. I mean, it, even then it was very hard and you couldn't get any answers as to what that mm -hmm. is. But yeah, I mean, there's, there's no doubt that demand for our products, uh, people are spending more time at home. You know, we, I think that anything home centric is, is set to boom. Even what we're doing right now, you know, Zoom and, and conference calls and things that are happening at home is a booming industry. Education at home is a boom. Fitness at home is a booming industry. So you have all these things that are booming. And there's no doubt that, that cooking food um, and eating at home is, is a trend that's going to continue even as, um, you know, various levels of lockdown changes. It's, it's here for the future. There's been huge runs on bread makers and, you know, worldwide shortages of yeast. And so absolutely, the demand is, 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 on, is on the up for, for anything, actually, that people can do. Yeah, I think yeast and pineapples have been the ones that have been going together. <laughs> I think it's got a bit more to do uh, with the fact that you can't buy liquor now. Craig, I want to bring you in here because we've got a, a very interesting question here from one of our uh, viewers that are watching you guys at home and they're very impressed with uh, what you guys have to say. And I think it comes down to this whole thing about what is an essential item. He says, you can buy a decoder, but you can't buy a TV, for instance. Uh, you know, you can buy tea and coffee, but you can't buy a kettle and, and that sort of thing. I mean, Craig, have you got some of these absurdities that, that don't make sense that you've come across? Yes, uh, there, there are so many of those. <laughs> uh, you know, Andrew made a, a very good argument. Um, you know, should you be able to buy a PlayStation Network voucher or a Google Play voucher or a Netflix voucher? Mm -hmm. Um, is that essential right now? Um, but uh, you better hope that your TV didn't break because you definitely can't uh, order that. Um, something I heard um, uh, Kim Reed speak about is that you can bring in uh, winter fabrics now, but our industry needs summer fabrics so that we can start manufacturing goods for uh, for summer when that uh, when that comes along. Um, so yes, uh, you know it seems like certain things have been decided as as more equal than others, but um, it's a never-ending uh, process because once you've decided one thing is, is allowed, um, you know, what is that next thing? And, and how do you start policing it and differentiating um, you know, these different levels of goods? Mm -hmm. When we get to level three, will we have uh, more categories um, allowed? And, and what happens when uh, I'm based in Johannesburg and we're on level three, but Cape Town is, you know, on level four or five? Mm -hmm. um, does that mean I can sell the goods but I just can't ship it to you yet until later and, and yeah. you know how do we how do we regulate that mm. um, so I think the argument around you know following what we are calling a risk-based strategy and actually founded on risk um, and, uh, and and not mm. on what is considered fair uh, yeah. that to me make uh, I, I think the point that I think the point that was made earlier about you know if you can deliver it and it can be done safely um, you know, practicing all the protocols, then, you know, we should be allowed to do it. I've got a great one here from Tanya Petzer, and I feel her pain because I've got a three-year-old toddler at home uh, during this lockdown. She says she's, uh, this madness, con I can't even buy a ball online for my toddler because it's classified as a toy. Now, I don't know uh, how many other parents are out there having to try and keep three-year-olds entertained uh, during this period, but um, I would certainly classify toys as an essential service mm. during this time. Absolutely. We, we were actually in a, a, a checkers uh, just last week and we saw part of their, their shelves were caught in off uh, with the toys and saying, unfortunately, you can't buy this. 
And you know, we've we've now had the risk. The, uh, the public go and walk foot into your store. Um, they can buy a chocolate, but they can't buy a card to go with the chocolate. Yeah. Uh, they can't buy toys for their kids. Um, it's just absolute madness. And um, you know, stock has been sitting on shelves, been sitting in warehouses. Um, it's had time that if it did even have some remnant of a virus on it, that it's it's long been destroyed. Um, there's certainly no risk. Um, in in uh, you know trading and picking up some of these goods and, and shipping them more effectively. Mm. And Jonathan, um, you know, obviously, you know, there's the, some questions coming through here. Has there been engagement with the industry? Uh, do you guys have an industry body that's been engaging with government? Uh, if so, uh, you know, have, uh, has it been listening? What what is the what has the reaction been? I think you know we're, we're at the point now where civil society is starting to take a bit more action, right? And they have been for the last few few mm. weeks because I think. You know, initially, I think the country is very behind this, and even with the extension to some degree, but now people are starting to go, listen, this is a little crazy, as we're, we're all saying, you know, how can this be and this not be? And, and fundamentally, the, the damage this is doing to the economy is, is really, you know, horrendous. So, you know, there, there isn't, there are some industry bodies, but one thing we actually, was actually went out today, um, you know, a lot of our businesses that have an association with each other, we got together and actually commissioned quite an extensive study of uh, small to medium enterprises in uh, in South Africa. So this is the likes of ourselves, Retail Capital, Heavy Chef, Yoko, uh, Ikorka, you know, Sure Swipe. There have been a lot of businesses that service. We collectively estimate we probably service about 500,000 businesses. So we commissioned a very broad-based study on this and we've actually publicized the results now. So you'll start seeing that coming out um, in the various social media channels. And part of that was to actually build up the information to actually take this to government and say, listen, look what this is doing to the country. Here's some real data from, you know, representative data of what this is doing, how long people will survive, have they been forced to retrench people, how many people are supporting in their business, what is the direct impact to them, what is the direct impact to the economy. So it asks a lot of these questions and summarize those results and we've uh, published kind of the key findings on that. So, you know, that's something that there's been a lot of activity that's been happening behind the scenes and there have been guys doing something in the curry industry in New Africa, have been doing a lot, a lot of work there. Um, you know, there's this e-com uh, forum specifically. So there really is a lot, you know. Uh, for us, I'm just very pro-business in general. And, and this was a very uh, broad-based uh, study that was commissioned across various businesses, be they online or offline. Uh, it's just business in general in this country mm. and mm. the impact that this yeah. is having. Great. Well, thank you very much to all of you. There's been some great feedback from the viewers at home. And obviously, we encourage our viewers at home to, if they can, help keep small businesses alive, to make use of all of these services that they've heard about today. Uh, just to keep to keep things going. So I want to say thank you to all of you and thanks for the job that you guys are doing uh, to keep the economy moving forward. We're really grateful uh, for the work that you're doing and we're going to keep pushing from our side to expand this up. And I think we were joined today by Kasatu, who've now announced that you know they've called on government now to also move to level three, start easing the hard lockdown, because I think they're starting to realize the effect this is going to have on all of their members. So thank you very much. Uh, we'll carry on pushing. And um, thank you for the work that you're doing. And thank you for taking time to join us today on CoronaCast. It's been fascinating. Um, I've got some great new insights that are also going to empower us to be able to take the argument further and try and uh, win the argument on, on why it is important for us to expand e-commerce rather than to constrict it. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Natesh. I mean, Thank there it is. I mean, we've got a very interesting question from Samaya from the Daily Maverick. She says, e-commerce is not entirely banned. It's restricted to only essential items and allowed under the current. Why are we framing the restriction as a wholesome ban on e online shopping? I don't think we've done that at all. I don't think we've uh, done I think that, that at all. Uh, that if anyone has been watching the show, uh, Samaya would absolutely see that uh, we have been talking about what is available, what's not available, but how we expand this so that we can help keep more SMMEs going and how we can keep more small business businesses alive at the side. Um, should um, non-essential items be unrestricted? Well, I think that the question is, what is an essential item? What is a non-essential item? We've traversed that today. Absolutely. And um, I think Andrew, Andrew, yeah, Andrew hits on it, it perfectly. I mean, the, the, the lingo the that, that's used and, yeah. and how there is no such yeah. thing as a niche market yeah. anymore because everything yeah. is now needed. And mm. John, wouldn't it be wonderful if, mm. if uh, our guest today got invited to a cabinet meeting? Yeah, it would be great. I mean, if people actually understand business. Exactly. You know. And then uh, Samaya also goes further to say that uh, it's inevitable that people be infected and more deaths will occur. 
um, is limiting the number of infections and casualties a priority to the DA? Of course it is. And anyone who's looked at the smart lockdown model that we've presented, you know, the phased approach, shows how you open up the economy, right. but safely. That even in the level one that we've proposed, there's still the use of masks, there's still social distancing, there's still a ban on gatherings. But the point is, if there is a business that can open up, that can practice safety, can practice PPE, can screen and test its employees and make sure that there's social distancing in the workplace, should be allowed to go back to work. You know, the fundamental point that so many South Africans and so many of the commentariat miss is that the point of the hard lockdown is not to kill the virus or stop it. Absolutely. It's to buy you time to prepare yourself. We all know the spark is still coming. Absolutely. The spark's coming later, later this year. Yeah. What we haven't been able to prepare for in six weeks is not going to be done. And, you know, we've already seen provinces here in the Western Cape, the RCC has been turned into 800 bed emergency hospital planning for that. The virus is going to be with us for 18 to 24 months. Absolutely. We cannot shut down the economy for 18 to 24 months. There'll be nothing left thereafter. John, the fact of the matter is this. We need to protect lives, but we need to protect livelihoods. Yes, absolutely. And that's what we've said yeah. from word go. And yeah. the fact of the matter is we cannot have people dying of mm. hunger and starvation mm. because the government refuses to, to look at safe ways to open up the economy. Mm. We cannot keep the economy closed mm. indefinitely. It's, it's, it's killing our, it's mm. killing our country. Mm. And, and, and quite frankly, for, for anyone to think that, that we, are, we don't care about people's lives. Mm -hmm. In fact, it's, it's quite the opposite. Mm -hmm. We care so much about lives mm -hmm. and livelihoods because it's not binary one or the other. They mm -hmm. go hand in hand because when, mm -hmm. when this lockdown ends, people are going to need jobs. They're going to need money to put food on the table and to educate children mm -hmm. and, and to just live their lives. Yeah. So it's not as simple as yeah. saying you, you don't care about lives. Of course we do. Yeah. There's two key things here that, that they miss um, uh, that that they, that they miss here as well, is that there is an intrinsic link between GDP and life expectancy and infant mortality. Absolutely. So an economic, grinding economic crisis has got the potential to really harm many, many more South Africans than the virus ever could. The second point here is that no one is saying, let's go back to business as usual, mm. life before the virus. Mm. That's not possible until a vaccine or an effective treatment is found. We're looking at an 18 to 24 month period. We've got to manage this virus during that period. And you don't manage it by keeping the country in hard lockdown. No. And it's not just the DA saying that. Professor Karim said it two weeks ago. He said, you know, the hard lockdown has run its course. Mm. Uh, we now need to start getting back to, uh, you know, a, a, a normalcy, in inverted commas, where we're managing the virus. And that's why the DA smart lockdown is so much better than what we're currently seeing because it allows you to trans transition between those. And when that spark comes, we can contract back into a level four, level five if we need to. But certainly for the next few months that we have before the peak is expected, we're able to open up our economy. There are many South African households going hungry, many, many South African households who are really stand the risk of losing the very roof over their head right. during this period because of an economic depression. We can't allow that to happen. It's, as you said, lives and livelihoods. And I, people are starting to see it. Kasati today, everyone. Trevor Manuel yesterday, and even Philip Dexter wrote a, even Philip Dexter wrote a piece in the Daily Maverick today in which he says, you know, we must open up the economy, economy yes. uh, but not for the reasons John Stiernason says. Yes, anything and but th that. And then yeah. goes and lists all the reasons I've set out why the economy must open. Now, this is... Uh, but, but John, if you look at, at mm -hmm. international best practice, mm -hmm. I mean, economies that are much stronger than ours have mm -hmm. realised that, that they're under mm -hmm. serious risk and they're mm -hmm. having to open up in a safe way. Mm -hmm. So there is absolutely no excuse that, that we don't even... We, we've got best practice that mm -hmm. we can follow. The economy has to start opening mm -hmm. up. We actually don't have a choice anymore because mm -hmm. that is how dire the situation is and given the fact that before the lockdown almost 11 million South Africans were unemployed mm. the the prospect of what could happen Yo, is, is almost terrifying. too frightening to comprehend it's terrifying terrifying absolutely and economists predicting we could wipe out one-fifth of our GDP I mean that is that's massive. huge you it's know, huge in USA, a country like ours you say Japan they can deal with it we can't manage we around that type can't. of loss 285 billion rand, Keith Vetter said this week, loss in revenue. Uh, that is a huge hole in the fiscus for what we were already budgeting for. Yes. Never mind the challenges. And the other point, the key point, is that our health response is linked to our economic well-being because government revenue depends on the economic activity of active South Africans. Of course. If you don't get uh, economic activity, you don't get the revenue in, how are you going to buy the ventilators, 
pay the doctors and nurses, pay for the test kits, the front line. You need that revenue coming in. So it just makes sense on so many levels. Let's open the economy in a safe way and in in, in practicing safety all the way uh, so that we can get as many of, the, of South Africans who can go back to work safely back to work. There's some industries that we must accept are not going to be able to. I don't see restaurants, for instance, no. being able to sit uh, and you know, have a, a whole a room full of people in one place. Of course not. But, you know, there are other businesses and we've spoken to some and of the And there's other ways today. businesses yeah, can, operate. can operate. We're going to have to be uh, innovative yeah, in the yeah. way we do things. So let's save the lives and the lives. Absolutely. Well, thanks, Tash, for joining me again today. It's always great to have you on here, the Chief Whip of, of the DA in Parliament. And keep up the good uh, fight there. It's important that we continue to, to make those hard points there. Well, folks, uh, it's been an interesting episode and I hope that you found it as exciting as I did. Certainly to hear from people who actually understand business, people who understand what it takes to get an economy working, and people who are responsible for employees uh, who depend on them and look to them to be able to provide a living. So let's do what we can as citizens to put pressure on government to start easing out of the hard lockdown and start opening up the economy more in a safe way, still practicing PPE, still using our masks. And I've got a great new mask given to me this week and uh, I think it's gonna become the, the, the gift of the season. Uh, if you can uh, you know, get a new mask for your birthday or for Christmas, the, uh, there's some really innovative ones going. I'm waiting for somebody to invent one that can help with running because Jeep is running in a mask is, is a bit of a challenge in our uh, three hours of yard time given to us by Minister Tele. Um, but yeah, sort of, let's keep the masks on, let's practice the PPE, uh, let's do social distancing, let's use our hand group, and let's open up the economy in a safe way so we can get as many South Africans who it is safe to go back to work for, back to work. So thank you very, very much. And then uh, obviously the last question that's coming through, Western Cape numbers. Well, I think you only need to look at the uh, press conference held by Zwilliam Kieser this week, who visited the Western Cape, really pleased with the response that we are uh, doing here, going out and looking for those small bushfires that Professor Kareem had in his slide, rather than ending up having to deal with a raging inferno. So the more testing, tracing and tracking, the more you actively go out looking for the virus, the more you're gonna find it, but it also then helps you build up a data set that means you can manage the virus better going forward. So thank you to Premier Windy and the team uh, for what they're doing there. That's all we've got time for this week. Uh, don't forget to join us on Friday again where we'll have another action-packed show. My shout out this week goes to Professor Mahdi from Wits University who in an excellent interview with the Daily Maverick this week and I really recommend it uh, to you to read. The Daily Maverick uh, really got some great pieces out there on COVID. I encourage you to read them. There's a few you should avoid. I won't tell you which ones. Uh, you can make up, that, uh, make up your mind yourself. Um, but um, really good stuff. And in an interview with Mark Haywood in the Daily Maverick, sets out the case exactly why the efficacy of the hard lockdown is past. It's time for us to stop moving to a stage where we manage the virus in a responsible way, given that it's with us for 18 to 24 months. Thank you for the insights, Professor Marty. We'll see you all on Friday. Stay safe, South Africa.